genius in my book on biography, and whilst I was writing that book, I was giving a talk in Edinburgh University, and I mentioned the word genius in the paper, and a friend and colleague afterwards said, so what is genius? And I had no answer for him. And I realised that genius is one of those concepts that seems self-evident, but in fact needs reinventing and redefining all the time. So, embarrassed that I should have so casually mentioned genius in this paper, and then discovered that I know what I was talking about, I decided that I'd better um, do a bit more work on the subject. And as I read around, I realised that I was not going to find out what genius was, and I also realised I wasn't that interested, because the thing that was interesting was the way that people talked about genius. Who talked about it, when they talked about it, how they talked about it, what their motivations for talking about genius were. So what I ended up doing was writing a history of the idea as it has been talked about, and one justification for doing this, because you could say there's lots of stuff on genius, and why write another book about genius? Well, part of my answer, beyond my own interest, which seems enough to keep me going for a while, uh, part of the answer is that people haven't written very much about the idea of genius in France. People write about Diderot endlessly, but they don't write about genius except in this rather piecemeal way, and they keep coming back to Diderot. But there's no continuous history of the idea of genius in France, and it struck me that the reason for that is that there's no continuous intellectual tradition for talking about genius in France. Genius, as it were, gets handed on from one discipline or one discourse to another, um, and it seemed to me that very often it was new discourses that got picked up the idea of genius and sort of thought about genius afresh in an attempt, well not always, part of their attempt to uh, construct their own discipline. That's rather a crude um, justification, but it certainly helped like well in working out what to write about in, in this book. Well, um, I'm going to give you a taste of the book, um, and I'm going to do it by talking about child prodigies, which involves three different moments and three different ways of talking about genius. It also involves beginning with a kind of cliché, um, and I think when you're talking about genius, cliché is never very far away. When you start thinking about genius, you kind of start from the clichés. And it may well be that you end up with the clichés, but you go other places on the way. Youth is certainly one of the defining features of genius, as we come to think about it in the modern e era. In other words, we think about it as an innate and natural gift, and it makes it almost a clearness I mean, to talk about untutored genius. From about the 18th century onwards, genius is by definition untutored and innate. So in his Réflexion critique sur la poésie et sur la peinture, first published in 1719, uh, which contains some of the earliest discussions of the modern idea of genius in France, the Abbé Dubos writes, ce que l'on avec du génie fait le mieux, et ce que personne ne lui a montré à faire. And this idea that genius spontaneously reveals itself um, is the means whereby the idea that genius is inborn um, is established. And he goes on to say, Tout devient palette yes. entre les mains d'un enfant doué du génie de la peinture. Il se fait connaître aux autres pour ce qu'il est. Can't we men ne le sait pas encore? So the genius, the untutored genius, spontaneously revealing his genius before he knows he has it. Uh, the idea of the youthfulness of genius um, gets dug in and leaping briefly across the channel to Edward Young, 
who wrote his conjectures on original composition uh, in 1759, um, we find uh, the declaration that original genius enters early upon reputation since fame, fond of new glories, sounds her trumpet, her trumpet in triumph at its birth. So a genius is born, it's not made, and it's established with a trumpet blast. But he adds to this view the further claim that whatever its age in years, genius, I quote, enjoys a perpetual spring and remains forever young. So it's not just that genius is revealed early, it is by definition a youthful phenomenon. And with the advent of romanticism, the perpetual youthfulness of genius was increasingly regarded as a guarantee of the freshness of its vision and of its ability to purge the world of the prejudices and presuppositions of convention and stereotype. This came to be the role of genius to throw out convention and rules and to establish a kind of spontaneous expression of an authentic uh, nature and creativity in its place. And this has the effect of creating a quasi-synonymy between genius and childhood that runs throughout the 19th century. In the view of Schopenhauer, so to leap away from France uh, eastwards for a moment, every child is to a certain extent a genius, he says, so genius becomes widespread, um, but equally, I'm uh, still quoting from Schopenhauer, every genius is to a certain extent a child. Or again, he says, every genius is already a big child since he looks out onto the world as into something strange and foreign and thus with purely objective interest. But the childishness of genius has, no virtue, has virtues that no child can retain, which was a point that um, others made, for example, Michelet, who has quite a lot to say about genius on and off, uh, Michelet says that genius may have an affinity with childhood through the freshness of its vision, unclouded by conventional excessive analysis, but this equivalence notwithstanding, le génie a le don de l'enfance comme ne l'a jamais l'enfant. And this is because le génie garde l'instinct natif dans sa grandeur, dans sa forte impulsion, avec une grâce de Dieu que malheureusement l'enfant perd, la jeune et vive espérance. So the genius succeeds in being a child for longer than children, real children, can manage. And this idea may be familiar to you too from Baudelaire, who says that the genius shares with the child the ability to see the world afresh. Um, but if genius is equated with childhood, it's a childhood rediscovered and reformulated by the adult artist who, in Baudelaire's account, has the necessary attributes of virility, that's Baudelaire's word, and analysis that any real child will lack. The childhood of genius has therefore to be actively sought out and reinvented. So that he famously ends up saying, le génie n'est que l'enfance retrouvé avanté. Well, despite these qualifications, genius and precocity have, as I said, remained integral to the way in which genius is conceived, although it's with quite varying consequences and in a variety of different contexts. But we find Derrida, as late as 2003, in his book, Genèse, Généalogie, Jean et le génie, saying, uh, le génie est toujours jeune, Jeune par essence, par essence jeune, il ne vieillit pas. So there is Derrida claiming um, that, uh, once again, that genius and youth go together like love and marriage, so to speak. So what I want to do today is to look at three moments, as I said, over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries when this equation of genius with youth came to particular prominence in the figure of the child prodigy. And the three areas what I want to look at are, first of all, the literature for children that burgeoned from the early years of the 
19th century onwards, then um, I want to look at the development of the IQ test, which was invented by a Frenchman, and the laboratory analysis of child prodigies. And finally, I want to look at the case of Minou Toy, the child poet who created a storm in the popular press in France in the mid-50s. And what's striking about each of these instances is the way in which the child, the child prodigy, is regularly called upon to perform his or her talent for the benefit of an adult audience. And the result of this is paradoxically that the child, the figure of the child, which seemed initially to authenticate the genius, it's inborn, it's spontaneous, it's the opposite of conventional rules, the child um, paradoxically ends up, as a result of his or her performances, opening the whole concept up to question and placing it in doubt. So to begin with children's literature, <clears throat> you might remember that in Les Mou, Sartre conveys the flavour of the characteristic uh, portrayal of precocious genius in 19th century children's literature when he recalls the stories in what's probably a fictitious volume which he calls L'Enfance des Hommes Illustres, a dark blue volume awarded to his uncle in 1885, his second prize for arithmetic. That touch is glorious. Um, and uh, Poulou, the young sat, is bored by the blandness of the virtues of these children, these enfants, or future, future hommes illustres. And then he's fascinated and appalled as one after the other they innocently exhibit the telltale signs of their future genius. What appalls him is the assumption that he is himself a genius, that's not the problem, but that as a genius he's giving out signs of his future, the signs of what his talents will be when he's an adult, and that these signs will only be legible in retrospect when he's dead. So that's what gives him a nasty turn. Um, <clears throat> but the tradition for this type of narrative, the generic, as it were, our fast is only used, took off, as I said, at the turn of the 19th century, and one of its earliest examples is Nougavé's Enfant Célèbre, which dates from 1810, and it was itself quite celebrated. And if you read Balzac's Louis Lambert, you find the narrator thrilled when the teacher tells the class that there's a futur génie, Louis Lambert, about to join them. And as the narrator has read the Nougavé, he has all sorts of ideas taken from Nugari's book about the likely nature of this future shimi. He anticipates someone like Le Petit Moncalm, Pico de la Mirandola, Pascal, and all the other um, examples of, I'm taking quoting from the title of um, Nugari's enfant, the full title of Nugari's enfant célèbre. Uh, other examples, oh no, I'm not quoting from Balzac, precocious brains, famous anomalies in the history of the human mind, whose early lives are recounted by Mugabe. But there are two main styles of these enfants célèbres. Um, to look at, uh, take the example of uh, Candiac de Montcalm, whose name may not mean a great deal to you, but he crops up quite a lot in this literature. He was a prodigy of learning, and he had mastered Latin by the age of four. And he assimilated the works of a multitude of historians, orators, epistolarians, grammarians, and philosophers. And he was very soon conversing with academicians about geometry, languages, history, and geography. However, he achieved all this by the age of seven, because that's when he died, and his fame therefore rested on the manner in which he conducted himself in childhood. He really was very precocious, he was an extraordinary child. What he would have been as an adult is, we, we, no one would ever, would ever know because he died. 
The other model is the model exemplified by Pascal. <clears throat> and the story of Pascal crops up again and again and again, even more than the story of Condiac de Montcalm. Um, and he, according to Lugaret, donna a heureux présage de ce qu'il serait un jour when he was still a child. He, <clears throat> Lugaret devotes one of his longest entries to the story of the persistence that led the young Pascal to discover the first 33 of Euclid's presuppositions for himself through the subtle penetration of his genius. The story is that Pascal, who was, as we would say nowadays, home educated by his father, had been banned from studying mathematics by his father, and the actual reason for that was. Um, I think he was rather highly strung and um, perhaps it was considered too stressful, but there was no stopping the boy. And he worked it all out for himself, even without the books, which is a story told again and again in um, these um, enfant célèbre type of narrative. So he was, in his childhood, he was anticipating, was revealing what he would be as an adult. So whether the children were famous for what they were as children, or whether their childhoods were described for what they intimated of the adult genius, they were equally exemplary. And what they exemplified were virtues that their young readers were encouraged to emulate, and which the young Sartre later found so anodyne. It's a bit paradoxical because the thing that's stressed so much in these stories of the spontaneous expression of genius is the studiousness of these children and their learning, along with the moral qualities of piety and good citizenship. So, in reading the stories of, of the lives of these children, um, real children who are probably not geniuses were going to work on and be pious, do what their children say, uh, do, do what their parents say, and then become good citizens. But of course, they also exemplified their own genius, and this was more for admiration on the part of young readers than for emulation. You can't emulate genius by definition. In the, there's a more sentimental mode of these stories that emerged around the middle of the century. And the, it, they often did so in scenes where the heart of an obstructive or hostile adult is melted by the performance of the child's genius. So the, the example set by genius is an example that's set within the story, as it were, for the benefit of an adult who is persuaded by the extraordinary talent of the child in question. And so there's some nice examples of this in a volume written by Louise Cully called Enfance Célèbre, which she wrote and published in 1854, which was the year her relationship with Flaubert came to an end. She was strapped for cash, and this was a good way of making some money. Uh, she failed uh, with more serious uh, attempts uh, involving poetry. Anyway, there are several such scenes in uh, Collet's Enfance Célèbre. So, for example, in her account of Fra Little Lippi, little Filippo and his sister are taken prisoner by a cruel bandit who threatens to make their parents destitute. But he relents when he's shown the portrait of one of the other brigands that the young Filippo has drawn. And he's so impressed that he immediately releases the children and moreover insists that the parents free the boy from having to mind the family sheep so that the way will be clear for him to become the great painter that he's obviously destined to be. So the performance of the future painter's art softens the heart of the brigand, saves the boy's family from destitution, so he's a good, good son, and by revealing his genius ensures its future realisation. What's interesting is that in these stories there's a number of girls and uh, Louise Cully, I think, pays particular attention to girls and not that many of them, but one of them is Jacqueline Pascal, um, her more famous brother's sister, um, and she's portrayed reading her poems before an audience of ladies from the court. And the queen can't believe that a child would be capable 
of writing such excellent poems without the help of an adult. Now, Jacqueline, who is characterized here as being as gifted in poetry as her brother is in science, retreats to a corner at the prompting of one of the other ladies and quickly improvises two poems, one after the other, which she then reads. At which all doubts about Jacqueline's authorship are instantly dispelled through uh, the impromptu demonstration of her exceptional talent. So there she is uh, reading her poems to Anne Autriche, who is the adult who is persuaded by the demonstration of her, her special talents as a poet. Uh, the spectacle of precocity repeatedly astounds the adults in these tales. Um, so if we move on now to uh, a volume by Victor Delcroix, and we get another staple from um, these stories, the young Mozart. This is actually an illustration from the Louise Cully version of the story. But as uh, Delcroix writes, on n'avait jamais vu un talent si précoce. Uh, never seen such a precocious talent uh, when he's writing about the six-year-old Mozart in his Les Jeunes Enfants Illustres, published in 1862. And what the young Mozart is famous for in these stories is his stealing of Allegri's Miserere from the Vatican. It was, um, the music for it was never written down what it was. It was never let out of the Vatican and it was a sort of sacred secret. Well, Mozart went in, uh, listened to the mass, heard Allegri's Miserere, took it on board, went home, worked it all down. And that's how it got out. But that was proof, not that he was a thief, although there was that in the story, but that he was, um, he had musical genius. Anyway, because he was a bit of a thief, because he'd stolen this, everybody expects the Pope to be incredibly angry and to punish the boy. But instead of this, the Holy Father sees the child's feet of memory and musical intelligence as proof of a God-given genius which he predicts a great future. Mon fils, he says, Dieu a mis en vous le génie. Vous serez plus grand qu'à l'écrit. And in fact, he also predicts that Mozart's greatest work will be his most pious work, the mass that he writes on his deathbed. Anyway, however self-evident the prodigy's talent may be, it still has to be performed for the benefit of the adults whose admiration and emotional response provide confirmation of the child's future destiny. Unwitting demonstrations of this destiny, of course, make for wonderful turning points in the narratives of budding genius, but they also establish this recurrent scenario whereby precocious genius meets skepticism and suspicion and is then required to prove itself by being demonstrated before an adult audience. And it's significant that these demonstrations that feature in the illustrations, that it's these demonstrations that feature in the illustrations which accompany a good many of the stories of these child prodigies. The genius, as it were, is being demonstrated in the illustrations themselves. You can see genius proving itself um, as the adult is convinced um, by the child's performance. So the illustrations are in a sense part of the story that I'm telling. Okay, so so much for children's literature. I want to move on now to Alfred Binet, um, the Frenchman who invented the IQ test. He was an experimental psychologist and uh, it was a discipline that emerged towards the end of the 19th century and he was particularly interested in um, the psychology, the developmental psychology. And as a result of these developments, the precocious child becomes the subject of a more systematic scrutiny and in this case it's completely separated from any kind of sentiment or moralizing. So, um, the child prodigy is in a completely different context 
and the four adults who have a very different attitude towards the child than did the adults who wrote and figured in the stories for children. And it's through the analyses of the experimental psychologist that genius gets re-described as superior intelligence and measured in a process where performance takes place as it were under test conditions, the test being the IQ test. As I say, it was Alfred Binet who devised and refined what he called the uh, échelle métrique de l'intelligence, the measuring scale of intelligence, between 1905 and 1911. He died somewhat prematurely in 1911. <clears throat> you will know, I mean, everybody knows about the IQ test, and it's partly because Binet's work was picked up by a group of American psychologists working under Lewis Terman at Stanford University and adapted to become the so called Stanford Binet test, which was used as the principal tool of investigation in the Stanford group's longitudinal study, Genetic Studies of Genius, which tracked the development of a group of intellectually gifted boys and girls into adulthood. It was also used in a quite extraordinary project to retrospectively calculate the level of intelligence in 301 geniuses of the past. Why 301? I don't know, it seemed incredibly surprised. It's so precise, and the attempt was precisely precision. How clever were they? What was their IQ? So the effect of all this is to define genius as the top end of a single scale of intelligence whose nether regions are represented by debility, imbecility, and idiocy, to use the terms current at the turn of the century. Notions of creativity, originality, or inspiration, previously associated with genius, are replaced here by the umbrella concept of intelligence, which it became the province of the discipline of experimental psychology and the techniques that made it possible to undertake what Binet called l'étude rigoureusement expérimentale des formes supérieures de l'activité mentale. Now, the measurement of genius was actually very far from Binet's aim, even if it became the prime concern of the Stanford Binet test. Binet's scale was devised in response to a request from a commission set up by the French Minister of Public Instruction in 1904 to explore strategies for educating retarded children. The special education that the commission proposed for such children required effective procedures to identify those who would be able to benefit from it. In other words, the aim was to identify débiles rather than prodigies and to use a scientific diagnosis of lower intelligence to differentiate at the bottom of the scale between these débiles and the weaker and ineducable, imbecile and idiot. In fact, if this sounds discouraging, uh, for Binet, who I thought was rather a sweetie, I came, came quite fond of Binet as I read him and read about him. Um, for Binet, rien n'est plus intéressant que de connaître la psychologie des cancres. And in Binet's hands, experimental psychology wasn't primarily a, a means of identifying prodigies so much as a basis for improving the education system, which he regarded as being in crisis. His horizons are collective and broadly utopian, and his ideal was a society where every individual, and not just the exceptional prodigy, is able to realize his individual aptitudes, whether they were intellectual or manual, creative or methodical, by means of appropriate education. Binet makes only brief mention of children at the top end of the scale, whom he describes as the surnum nominal. But they too have their part to play in this utopian order, and he envisages the provision of special education to ensure the greatest social benefit of their talent. So that society at large would benefit from the talents of the prodigy. So just as pity is irrelevant as a response to the feeble-minded, so there's no adult admiration for genius in the making here. In Binet's view, the talents of these surnormaux, 
Now, more commonly known in France as the Sciences Doué, should be harnessed for the benefit of social progress, to which they make an invaluable contribution. Now, measurement is the key to understanding the mechanism of intelligence and to translating it into a meaningful scale. And the start of all of this take, uh, <coughs> takes us back to the 1890s and to Vinay's encounter with two mathematical prodigies, Jacques Inaudi and Pimitles Diamandi, whose cases he wrote up in the Psychologie des Grands Calculateurs et Joueurs d'échecs. In 1880, the 13-year-old Jacques Inaudi, an illiterate Italian immigrant with an unusual gift for rapid calculations involving very large numbers, was presented to the Société d'Anthropologie by the neurologist Paul Poca, whose name is given to the part of the brain where speech is located, Broca's area. Inaudi, at the time, was performing at the Folie Bergère and making money out of his talent. And he was the most recent example of the so-called calculating boys who excited considerable public and scientific interest over the course of the 19th century. Everybody fell for them, if you like, and the astronomer Camille Flamagnon describes Inaudi as le plus extraordinaire calculateur des temps modernes. Well, in February 1892, he was summoned to a session of the Académie des Sciences to provide a demonstration of his talents. The academicians were impressed and set up a committee to examine his gifts. This committee included the mathematician Poincaré and the neurological specialist Charcot, he of hysteria fame, and the brief was, uh, a shuttle brief was to investigate the young man from the perspective of physiological psychology. Vinay at the time was one of Shuttle's assistants and was appointed to help carry out the examination which took place over the course of some 15 sessions between 1892 and 1893. In the resulting analysis, Vinay presents Inudi as the latest addition to the natural family of calculating prodigies whose main feature was the unprecedented and precocious character of its member's gift for calculation. Inodi's talents had emerged at the age of six. Like many of the calculators, he came from a poor background and had no formal education. He spent part of his childhood minding sheep and didn't learn to read or write until the age of 20. These calculating boys, and they are indeed all boys, display a number of characteristics that actually recall the prodigies portrayed in the tales of famous children being written in the same period, notably the poverty of their background and the spontaneous manifestation of their talent. In other words, the calculating prodigy looked like a genius in the making and quickly became the object of adult fascination. Many of them, especially the poorer ones, for obvious reasons, were put on show, performing for money. Inodi's family had been quick to set into lucrative youth, the lucrative use in various cafes in the south of France, and he later acquired more professional managers and in fact spent the rest of his life performing in vaudeville and circuses. Now, despite the fact that much was made of the writing down of large numbers on the blackboard in Edor D's performances, is a picture from an Italian magazine of a performance being given by Edor in Paris, <laughs> Um, Beale's laboratory tests demonstrated that even these feats lay with his memory rather than with his calculating prowess as such. And he turned out to be a rare example of the phenomenon of auditory as opposed to visual memory. He retained large numbers which he manipulated in his calculations through multiple repetitions. Memory of the audience would call out the figures which were repeated first by Inodi's manager, you can see he's done it by the blackboard, um, and then by Inodi himself as the assistant wrote the numbers down. When Bine interfered with Inodi's standard routine by preventing him from repeating a number out loud and obliging him to sing a single vowel instead, 
NOD's calculations were slowed down by a factor of two or three. ENOD could as astonish his vaudeville audiences by instantly naming the day of the week for any given date of birth and by recalling every one of the numbers chalked up on the blackboard behind him over the course of an evening. But scientific analysis revealed a different picture. When performing under laboratory conditions and tested against a group of four cashiers from the Bon Marché department store, Inodi's skills in basic calculation, addition, multiplication, and so on, turned out to be no greater or faster than theirs. Binet's results are set out in tables that note the speed of different calculations down to the last half second. So number was clearly an effective method for demystifying in all these apparently exceptional way with numbers. And Binet compares Inod with figures like Ampere, the physicist and mathematician, Gauss, the German mathematician, George Parker, who became a distinguished engineer, who had also been calculating prodigies in their childhood. But Binet notes that their precocious gift for calculation waned as their intellectual interest in mathematical concepts grew. And this leads Binet to distinguish between the serious mathematician and the mere calculator on the basis that while they both exhibit the same precocious skill in that mental calculation, for those with true mathematical genius, it's a mere accident in their existence, as he puts it, and they're destined to rise much higher, as he also puts it. Inod never moved beyond basic calculation and gave no sign of having any adult intellectual appetites. He wasn't interested in exploring alternative strategies for calculation, and he preferred to keep his own sometimes quite cumbersome methods rather than try some algebra, which would have helped him a great deal. Despite his phenomenal memory for numbers, he had none for words. He was, he was prone to forgetfulness in practical matters, which he um, seemed rather disapproving about. He was also somewhat disapproving about the fact that Inodi organized his life for instant gratification, he got up late, he'd spend his afternoons playing cards or billiards, and his intelligence in Binet's assessments was mediocre. Now, it wasn't Binet's aim to denounce Inod as an imposter, but the effect of his analysis is to identify the quite specific mental features that are responsible for his apparent talent. He wasn't the extraordinary, the most extraordinary calculator of modern times that Camille Flammarion claimed he was. What he had was an exceptional memory for figures and an unusual power of concentration, which he displayed during his performances but there was nothing more to it than that. So the difference between those who grow up to become serious mathematicians, mathematicians of genius, if you will, and the mere calculators, is that the calculators never grow out of being the prodigies that they were in childhood. And in effect, as Binet puts it, ce sont en quelque sorte des enfants qui ne vieillissent pas. I think you can sort of see that in a photograph of Binet, who looks curiously arrested in development, I don't know if it's to do with his height, um, but he's a strange looking cove. Anyway, the child prodigy is likely to remain a child for life, but in a sense that's rather different from that of Michelet or Baudelaire. His prodigious talents can be put to the test where they're quite precisely analysed and circumscribed to the point where they cease to be that exceptional. If anything is noteworthy about these prodigies for Binet, it's not the performance that draws the crowds in the cafes and the music halls, but the fact that they practice their skill on a regular basis. Even if they're reluctant to acquire any further education, as D was, they nonetheless offer a useful example for educators because they suggest that mastery of certain subjects, and Binet mentioned specifically mathematics and languages, would benefit from extended balance of intensive practice. So it's an irony, really, that the lesson that Binet draws from these child prodigies is that the education of the average child can benefit from the insights into the practical aspects of their performance. He's far more interested in educational methods than he is in the genius with which he credits Ampere or Gauss, 
but which is content simply to assert and leave unexamined. His own methods of calculation exercised in the laboratory with its stopwatches and its assistants trained to measure intellectual performance provide a very different kind of audience from, for Inodi from the one that earned him his living as the greatest calculator of the age. This, I take it, is actually from a performance where there's a chap with a stopwatch in the background contributing to uh, the impression of extraordinary speed of calculation, but it was the stop stopwatch in the laboratory that showed how Bin and how Inodi's mind really worked. In Third Republic France, as distinct from 20th century California, the performance of precocious genius produces a rather different result to the performances of the child prodigies in the children's literature of the time. For though genius continued to impress vaudeville audiences, the notion of genius itself comes under pressure when placed in laboratory conditions, where it's translated into the quantifiable terms of scalar intelligence. And intelligence itself is seen as educable rather than innate. However, the notions of genius and of a child prodigy don't simply disappear. And in the 1950s, they surfaced again with particular potency and evident anxiety in the case of Minu Dhoi, my third and last example of the genius as child prodigy. Between September and December 1955, France was gripped by the so-called Affaire Minou Drouy. Minou was a previously unknown eight-year-old poet who caught the public imagination. The affair was triggered and to a certain extent engineered by the advanced publicity distributed by uh, René Julien for uh, Minou Drouy's collection of poems and letters entitled Abouk Monani, which gives you a flavour of her work, which was scheduled to appear in January 1956. Over the course of the autumn, the affair took off and turned into a full-scale chorale. <clears throat> as the authenticity of Mina's talent was called into question, the chorale was pursued largely in the press with the women's magazine Elle and the daily newspaper Le Figaro playing key roles on either side of the debates about the nature of genius in general and Minou's precocious talents in particular. Journalists busy themselves trying to provide evidence in support of both views, and articles about Minou were almost invariably accompanied by numerous photographs of her engaged in characteristically childish occupations, whether practicing her piano or bouncing on her bed, however like that photograph, as if to make the point about her age. And that's also from Penny Match, um, which had two numbers involving photographs of me and Tori. Penny Match having been launched in 1949. <clears throat> And in these photographs, the prodigy Mimu Dhuri was, as it were, exhibited for public inspection. You are seeing genius, you are not seeing genius in the making of what's the implied legend. Thanks to the press, the Mimu became the object of collective curiosity fueled by contributions from people like Pasteur Valérie Radeau of the Académie Française, grandson of Louis Pasteur, who was obviously very taken with Milo, and he wrote, aurait on eu le droit de mettre sur le boisseau Rimbaud? Rimbaud was a child prodigy that was mentioned a lot during the Milo Tour affair. Le temps consacrera, j'en suis persuadé, l'enfant génial que Milo consacré Rimbaud. There were the major literary journalists of the day who got involved, and figures as various and as well known as uh, the songwriter Léo Fede, André Breton, and Jean Cocteau, who famously contributed to the debate with his pronouncement that tous les enfants de moins de 9 ans ont du génie sauf Minou Drouet, which sat quotes in Les Mou. In fact, I think Sartre saw himself as a sort of Minou Drouet character. 
Mill became the focus for many of the uncertainties and the contradictions associated with the notion of genius. And in due course, she roused both Sartre and Bart to major critiques of the concept, whether genius was conceived as imposture in the case of Sartre, or the embodiment of bourgeois contemporary myth in the case of Bart, and they seem to sound the death knell for genius. A degree of anxiety about imposture was already in the air, because Pascal Pia, one of the leading literary critics of the time, had had his fingers burnt over the supposed discovery of a lost manuscript by Hamburg, La Chasse Spirituelle, in a case which strengthened the association between precocity and fraud, because the manuscript turned out to be a fraud, and raised questions about the competence of literary critics to judge literary authenticity. Unlike the calculating boys, Mimou de Roy's success was due to her range of words rather than with mathematical calculation. And because the evaluation of Mimou's talent was subject to the verdicts of literary judgment rather than the scientific precision of laboratory analysis, this inevitably produced its own unease. Literary critic André Rousseau, writing in Le Figaro, the 5th of November, suggests that there's a generalised nervousness about genius, which has made people reluctant to give me her due. The author of an article in Marie France, you see the kind of uh, organ that's uh, getting interested in uh, Minou, recognises the difficulty of distinguishing between the youthful genius of Mozart or of Pascal, which is a promise of greater things to come, and mere precocity, which offers nothing more than the illusion of genius and will vanish with adolescence. Madeleine Chapsal, writing in L'Express, uh, acknowledges the embarrassment of this uncertainty. Nous voici pris au piège de notre exploration obligée d'avouer que nous ne pouvons conclure. And in December, Elle called upon 14 writers from Jean Genot and Marcel Pagnol to Jean Poulon, Cocteau and Sartre, as well as the nine-year-old daughter of the poet Jacques Prévert, to exercise this judgment. But by then, the problem had taken on a different aspect. No longer are these the poems the work of genius. Um, is is Mimou Drouet a genius in the making or a mere child prodigy? But rather, is Mimou really the author of these poems? Or could they have been written by her mother? Putting the question in these terms made the phenomenon much easier to deal with. André Breton, writing in Paris Press on December the 20th, was in no doubt that the poems had genuine literary value, but for him, this meant that they couldn't have been written by an eight-year-old child. Recalling the episode of the fake Bamboo manuscript and what it taught about the need to consider the internal evidence of the text himself, he claimed that the poems contained a certain timbre de la vie vécue que ne peut en aucun cas affecter la vie tout à vie. In other words, Mino was simply too young to be the author of the sentiments that her poems expressed. And uh, Breton backed this view by invoking the scientific argument and uh, a scientific argument and citing the magisterial research of the great French psychologist Piaget. The evident implication of Breton's remark was that the real author of Minou's poems was indeed Minou's adopted mother. There's a whole story about uh, Minou's adopted mother, um, which made her out to be quite a dodgy character rightly or wrongly. So the test of Minou's genius became an inquiry into the authorship of her work, but who had the expertise to judge? A self-styled psychotechnicienne wrote into the letters page of Le Figaro, diagnosing serious mental and emotional problems in the child and recommending med medical treatment, and she blamed Madame Drouet for not protecting Minou from the <coughs> that she'd attracted. François Observation had first raised doubts about the authenticity of the poems, in fact, as early as October the 16th, by asserting that il est impossible de croire qu'une main plus experte n'ait pas guidé ses petits doigts de sept ans et demi. And the literary critic, Robert Kemp, called for a full investigation. Thereafter, every journalist 
took it upon him or herself to subject me to a series of more or less covert tests in an attempt to establish authorship of the poems. Michel Pemin, who wrote the, first, wrote the first feature in L, encouraged Minou to recite some of her poems, in other words, to give a performance of her supposed talents, but she thought that Minou recited her poetry as if she were rattling off a lesson learned by heart. And she also found it suspicious that Minou was indifferent to the poetic sight of the sun setting over the sea, and that she was more interested in playing the friend's poodle, obviously not the behaviour of a genius child. So Minou is also shown up as not knowing the meaning of some of the words that she uses in her poems. She fails even to recognise one of the poems as her own, and she makes contradictory claims about whether she knows the work of Lamartine. So when Minou is tested by the ger journalist, her supposed genius is found wanting. It was an attempt to restore the girl's reputation when René Julien and his wife invited Minou to stay without her mother for five days. Minou was kept under observation and encouraged to write as many letters and poems as she could to provide proof of her gifts. In a later attempt to her, clear her name and to put an end to the end of scrutiny, Minou voluntarily subjected herself to a similar test under the auspices of the Société des Auteurs, Compositeurs et Éditeurs de Musique, the organisation responsible for overseeing the payment of rights to authors and composers. And these investigations had their own unstoppable momentum, and in a particularly gruesome episode, which she recounts in her memoirs, Ma Vérité, the BBC in London shut her into a studio with pen and paper, gave her a topic to compose upon, and the cameras rolled before a panel of experts. <clears throat> so, Mino was instructed to create, to perform. The more her genius is doubted, the more it needs to be authenticated, and authentication, though, can only take the form of a performance, and performance must always come as a response to demand, which inevitably breeds its own scepticism. The child prodigy becomes the child star. And although Minou continued to write, her poetry soon took second place to her career as a celebrity. And she appeared in a variety of venues. She modeled children's clothes for an upmarket label. She starred in a film that appeared under the title Clara et les Méchants, with Minou in the role of Clara. And Ma Vérité, her memoirs, includes photographs of her being received in the Vatican by the Pope having her hand kissed by Maurice Chevalier, and you remember he sang, sang the film with the girls, um, maybe in Vincent Minnelli's 1958, uh, Gigi, a box office success. And she even appeared in the Cirque d'Hiver with a huge python, and she ended up in some looking less like the young Mozart, or Jacqueline Pascal, Pascal than Shirley Temple, or even Jacques Inoudi, who would only recently died at the age of 83 after a long career on the stage. Well, Bart has some things to say about Mimi Dwory and about genius, which I won't um, linger on too long, but he is his wonderful essay on. Mimou Dvore, which was published in January 1956 and included in Mythologie, um, challenges the notion of genius and of uh, the value of Mimou's poetry and says that Mimou was the sacrificial victim of a society bent on seeing poetry, genius, and childhood in a particularly noxious combination, uh, an image of itself as part of the natural order. The function of genius is to perform the natural for the benefit of the, a bourgeois audience. <clears throat> and bourgeois culture creates the figure of the child prodigy from which it reads off a mix of precocity and poetry that is particularly potent because the image of the child poet answers an unspoken need at the heart of bourgeois ideology, namely its reverence for irresponsibility of which says that the genius, the child, 
and the poet are the sublimated figures. With Balfe's analysis, the original premises for supporting the precocity of genius are turned on their head. The supposedly innate character of genius, which seemed to be sanctioned by nature, and whose expression was its precocious manifestation in the form of the child prodigy, is re-described as the wishful thinking of bourgeois ideology. And once again, it would seem that youthful genius can't escape an adult demand for performance, and that the more it responds to that demand, the less it convinces, and the more it succeeds in casting doubt either on the authenticity of the talents of the performer or on the existence of genius itself. As the performances of precocious genius are subjected to various forms of scrutiny, the peripeteia of narrative in children's literature, Alfred Binet's experimental psychology, popular interest mediated by journalism and the cultural critique of that, <coughs> they have their cumulative effect of putting the whole notion into question. The only way out of this and pass for genius is to put a stop to the whole business of treating genius as a measurable quantity and um, even to stop trying to test it for authenticity. If it becomes possible to rehabilitate the idea of genius, as Derrida does, for example, in his book, incidentally inspired by Hélène Citrus's Manhattan, which we just back full circle to here, it's by embracing, or at least not excluding, all the myths associated with genius all the cliches, including that of its essential youthfulness. So it is Derrida, let me remind you, who I quoted near the beginning of this talk, who says, and he, he's not contesting the idea, le génie est toujours jeune, par essence, jeune, il ne vieillit pas, and nor, it would seem, does the idea, it's just a question of not trying to measure it too much and not demanding that it perform and it will stay with us and keep us talking. Thank you.